the trans liberal you love to hate. I'm back. Race, I don't bring up race in the sense of discriminatory or anything else. You know, if I talk about race because it's been so hard, whether I'm being a black woman, a black man, a black trans woman, whatever it may be, being a black person in America is dealing with racism. This is the Transparency Podcast Show. Welcome to a special episode of Transparency Podcast. I've actually got a special co-host today, Blossom C. Brown. The trans liberal you love to hate. I'm back. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. And we have an amazing episode for you today. Honestly, this is a legend in community. And I want to introduce you to Sabel Simone Lareca, and that's why you got to get her name right because we're putting this history right. <laughs> Welcome, hello, Sabel. Hey. hey, hey, hi. How you doing? I'm doing good. Mm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So doing good down a skid route. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, <laughs> we already starting to do a jump. I love this. So um, I've brought you here today because a. History and community, I have always seen a lot of the amazing things that you have done. Mm -hmm. B, you're just a flat-out bad bitch. (laughs) With a capital B, by the way. I wanted to bring my good friend Blossom with me because I really wanted to have a deep conversation about the history of L.A., you know, a lot of the things that especially Black trans women face, Mm -hmm. and just honestly the history that you've done in community that I don't think anybody truly knows the depth of your history and community here. I mean, I know because I've been around a long time, but I don't think it's ever been placed on record in hopefully the way that it will be today. And I wanted to set that record straight with you. So first of all, how the hell are you doing today? Let me start it with just an easy <laughs> question because I don't want to get you too much too fast. How the hell are you doing today? Did we, I'm doing fine. You know? I've been up since five this morning. Good? Yeah. Good, good. And then- Sweating and eating the blunt. But you look great doing it though. That's right. Just saying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not the blood. You know, not everybody get to look this good and at this age. True. Remember when we were on the phone yesterday <laughs> and I was like, what the hell? I w-? Shit. Listen, I won't reveal a lady's age, but I was shocked when I remember because I could have swore I celebrated another birthday. And then I was like, wait, it, I don't know how to do math. Damn, girl. Damn. But, you know, I digress on that. <laughs> um, girl, what's the tea? How you been? I've been good, you know. <laughs> Um, basically, I do what I normally do. You know, I stepped out of community for a while. Yeah. And I had to get some me time, you know. For a lot of us, it's, you know, when I transitioned, one of the biggest ways of getting on your feet without working the streets is to work in community. And so, you going to another job, working at Burger King, Moss Brothers, or working at the bank, wasn't a choice. So I started working off, working in the community, doing advocacy work, and that paid my housing, that paid my way through life and everything else that kept me somewhat off the street, because I still love them streets. Um, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm a hoe from the go. <laughs> <laughs> we Old love all. He this is the Transparency hoes. Podcast, right? We are sex positive here, 100%. Yes, yes we love hoes. <laughs> Shout out to all the hoes out there, just saying. Yes. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for a while um, as an advocate, and I stepped out not only because of some personal stuff I was going through at the time health-wise, but just because I didn't want to grow old doing HIV and transgender advocacy work all my life. You know, when I transitioned, I started. It was a way for me to go through life and, you know, have that income, but who said I got to share my life story and I got to constantly work in a community because I'm part of that community in order to survive my life. Yeah. You know, um, at the time it was, and this is like 93, 94, 95. At the time that was kind of the thing to do. Yeah. Um, But today that's a different choice. You know, my last job I worked was at Starbucks. You know, and in 93, working at Starbucks as a transgender woman was something that was never going to happen. And so that's one of the coalitions I have about as far as the future and the past goes, you know, whereas employment goes, even still today, we're having some issues with that. Um, 
at least a lot of the young folks and a lot of the folks that are transitioning today have the opportunity to have that nine to five job or that part time job or whatever type of job that is um, and be behind the counter. I think we as trans folks need to give some patience to some folks in a sense. Um, because not everything happens overnight. You know, LGBT folks just getting the right to marry. You know how long we've been fighting <clears throat> gay rights. And so as a trans woman, I don't often see that I have to fight for every step of the way anymore. You know, I used to feel that way in a sense, but I don't anymore. And so for me, I pick my battles. Mm. You know, if I walk into a store and she happened to say, sir, then I'd just be like, okay, girl, today you heard my hard voice. I'm going to be okay with that one. Yeah. Tomorrow we're going to try it again. Now, you see me coming to the store every day. You keep saying, sir, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna get the manager yeah, okay. I'm gonna and that 20% <laughs> discount. Like. I'm going to let you know. Yeah. You know yeah. It's one of those things where I just watch this. Um, it was a TikTok video of this girl or this trans person having to have this discussion with Delta Airlines staff. And on yeah. so many levels, I wanted to blame her, mm -hmm. in a sense, because I felt like she kept pushing the issue to be an issue. Yeah. yeah. And he was, like, trying to make it clear. And it was clear to me that he was, you know, I don't know how everybody wanted to perceive him to be hetero unless they just don't know. Yeah. As, a black gay, as a black trans woman, mm -hmm. my gaydar went off, and the I kind of knew no. that was one of my yeah. family members. And so they were trying to be respectful in every way possible from what I got from the video because they were like either sir or ma'am. So a lot of the times, you know, it's one of those things. How do you present when you walk in a store? Yeah. Or how do you present when you walk into an environment? Because how you present also determines how people address you. Yeah. You know, if you walk in and you got a full fledged beard and some eyeshadow and some makeup, I don't know if I'm going to be the one that's going to say, say, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say what you, I might not say anything. And if I can ask you, maybe I can ask you, you know, if I want to be really into <clears throat> how we say going the extra step, if I want to be political and, you know, a, politically correct, then I'll go into maybe all of that other stuff. But as someone that probably don't know any better or don't know the pronouns and stuff like that, then for me, it's about, I'm going to address you the way I see you. Yeah. Unless you give me another reason to address you differently, you know? And so it was just really hard for me to be on that bandwagon of judging him because of the way she presented and the attitude about it. Because the more I looked, watched the video, the more it was like I got kind of angry with her mm. because she just kept digging and digging <clears throat> and digging to the point where he got frustrated and he was like, look, I can just escort you out the building if you right. want to. And at that point, it's like, what have you proven? Nothing. Yeah. And to be fair, there's context missing because I know exactly which video you're talking about. And it's like, first of all, they were trying to compare her to one of her celebrity friends who's actually a friend of ours. Mm. And <clears throat> it was quite interesting how they did that because ultimately when I looked at the video, it's like, okay, we know a black man is not going to get a chance. It doesn't matter if he's queer. It doesn't matter if he's straight, okay? Secondly, she looks flustered about something, okay? She said in the video that she was misgendered several times, but from the piece that we saw, it was only maybe once. Mm -hmm. And he apologized for that. And so I think it's really important that we got to have all of the context of what's happening here. And I'm so glad that you brought up that video because that's, that's a really great point. Yeah, I, it was one part in it where she stated that um, the woman had said, Sir, ma'am, and stuff like that. And again, it's one of those things. At least she made the process of correcting herself to make you feel comfortable. You know, she didn't know how to address you. So she said what made her feel comfortable. And she said what she thought she could make you feel comfortable with by correcting herself. Mm -hmm. And yet you still <clears throat> kept digging into the situation. And so that's just, I mean, yeah. And she apologized. The woman apologized. And so it was like, what more do you want mm -hmm. at this point? Yeah. Yeah, and I can see that I did see that situation and it's it's a duality of multiple things happening at once, you know, with the the attendant there that was trying to do their job at the same time, mm -hmm. staying respectful within the bounds. Um, may there have been a little animosity, yeah, but I think it's being able to address that it was on both sides there and acknowledging that nuance that 
you know, there was a triggered individual in that space and it's understandable why they're triggered. I mean, if someone misgenders me, I mean, I'm going to give a gut reaction. I'm going to be like, whoa, that's, you know, um, maybe not every time I may not land it perfectly too. It, It depends on you're in the middle of travel, you're in an airport. There's a lot of different factors that were going on. And everybody's got a phone kind of in your face recording things. Right. So it creates this extra level of like, um, I'm not quite sure, maybe more an animosity to this, this space because maybe the interaction could have been handled if the camera was I mean, there's so many yeah, different I, things that we could argue. And my thing was, <clears throat> maybe if the camera wasn't there, the reaction would have been different on yeah. both sides. Yeah. But because there was a camera there, the reaction just kept, antagonizing the situation even more yeah it felt like and yeah because it seemed like the more he would say to her the more she would shove the camera into his face mm-hmm. and so that just made it that much harder um but yeah enough about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> well Listen, go ahead yeah you are a legend in this community and you are someone i feel does not get their flowers enough nope And as a black trans woman who's also in the same community, I admire your wisdom. I admire your experience, your storytelling, because you've been around the world. Ay, 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 ay. Yep. (laughs) Okay. Wait, you know what I mean? Wait, we gotta. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we got buttons too, girl. We upgraded. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me, tell us, how does it feel to see the legacy? that you are carving play out in real time. And that part, <laughs> damn. Damn, she came prepared to co-host today. Okay. Uh, kind of oh, wow. I mean, <laughs> we're on The View. <laughs> it's, I mean, first of all, when the life expectancy of a trans woman is 35 yes. or less than, and I have made it to 50 plus, um, just to say. <laughs> where, where, where's the, hold, hold on, let me get it together. Uh, I think we need this one. The ch- <laughs> we got a lot of programs. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are we doing? We're doing. Uh, the happy one. Where, where is it? We got to get a drum roll. Uh, cheers. Cheers. There it is. There yeah, it is. There we go. <laughs> hey, we're still okay. learning, all right? We just programmed the buttons. <laughs> but I mean, being able to survive through. Um, is a lot yeah. um, when we talk about being a black trans woman. Um, seeing my legacy of trans folks that have come through my path is, I mean, is I'm grateful. I'm, I'm just really grateful that I have been had the opportunity to be in so many trans folks' lives or to be a part of that or to give them that strength that says, I can do this too. You know, um, the part of not getting my flowers, I get my flowers every day in so many ways, you know, um, when I wake up in the morning and I can see I lived another day, I get Mm -hmm. my flowers. When I, um, read and look on Instagram or TikTok and see my community, you know, doing the work, I get my flowers, you know, because... I see where all of this was a progress of stuff that I advocated for when I transitioned back in 99, 99, years ago. <laughs> the 2000s. In the 1900s, actually, girl. You know, I'll just say it was in the 90s when I transitioned. Yeah, that's the 1900s. You know, that's I, a whole other century, girl. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But, Shit, COVID was five years ago. I just learned that you know, yesterday. We can go so. back to the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, But watching a lot of the youth that I've been involved with and seeing the, not even just the youth, but adults and, that have I've been a part of, you know, succeed and mm-hmm. progress is amazing. And to say that I had just a little bit to do with that. A little bit. Come um, on. This is where we're giving more credit. Listen, yes. listen, tell the story about like about you. Like tell, tell, tell the folk, tell, put it on camera. That's why we are here is to tell yes. this. Don't be humble about it because we know you, but I want folks out there to know you. So I started all of a lot of all of this. this. No. 
Imagine y'all, we get you watch. Or, um, <laughs> got, we got some advocating. queens already <laughs> typing in the types right now. They're like, what? I did this? Watch. I've advoc- yes, if you want to know more about me, Google me. Oh, that's I awesome. Fly line. <laughs> oh, <her> line. <laughs> <My> line. <laughs> but um, I've been in this fight since 19... 19- Hundred, <laughs> hundred. <laughs> Let's say, you know, um, I have to say, you know, for a lot of people that don't know, and I'm really open about who I am and what I am. You know, again, if I were to sit in front of you and say, who is, who is Sabelle? Well, Sabelle is a black trans woman. She's HIV positive. She's been Hep C positive. She's had cancer. She's had a couple other things go on in her life that's caused health and been very close to death because of her health. But yet today I sit here and I'm healthier than most people walk in this earth. So when I look at it from that perspective, that's who Sabella is. She's an, you know, she's an achiever. She's a survivor more than anything else. I've gone through a lot in my life. And so when we talk about um, poverty and the community of trans folks, I know what that means as a person of color. When we talk about housing and the process of being homeless or low-income housing, I know what that looks like because I lived that, you know, um, and still do today. Um, Lincoln Bio, make sure to hit a Venmo for her. You know, we're going to put that up later. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, When we talk about health care, you know, again, I'm HIV positive. I've been positive since 1986, 87. Uh-huh. And you know, my, I am undetectable. I have really good health. Um, I had TB. Um, I was Hep C positive for ten plus years, um, and very close to death with Hep C. Um, it came out a new research drug, and I was able to take that and was completely cured. Two days after I was diagnosed, after being cured of Hep C, I was uh-huh. given a diagnosis of having prostate cancer, and having to deal with that. Um, after four or five surgeries, and I am cancer free. Yes. Um, but so there are <laughs> blossoms on the butt. <laughs> yes. You know, um, to say that, you know, for a lot of trans folks out there, as well as people of col- trans women of color, you know, I love to be that one that says, we can make it, we can survive through anything if you want it bad enough. You know, a lot of my trans sisters and brothers, I know suicide rate for us is high. And what I can say to a lot of them is just, you know, patience, be patient. Mm -hmm. I would have never thought that 2024, I'd be sitting on a couch talking about my life as a podcast, on a podcast and what that means to me, you know, so um, be patient. Things happen. You survive it, you know. If you've made it, you know, it's a lesson. There's a lesson in there, you know. And I come from not such a religious family, although I'm more Buddhist than anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, But I did grow up in Catholic school and boarding school and stuff like that. And I was always taught. My my grandmother and my mother are very religious. And so I was always taught, God, don't give you no more on your plate than you can handle. And if you put it on your plate, then that means you could handle it. Yeah. And so I'm going to eat, yeah. you know, and that's what I do today. I eat, you know, no, give clearly. me something because I'm going to devour it. Don't tell me what I can't do because I'll prove you wrong. And you eat very well. You notice. <laughs> you notice. <laughs> I did. Body by skin. <laughs> 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 oh my god. <laughs> so, you know, I want to talk more about your work too. I mean, the HIV commission, there's history there. Like, tell yeah. me about it. I mean, were you the first? Is am I I wasn't the first. Okay. But there were folks that were on the commission before me. I just kind of pushed a little harder than most did. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of advocated the most. Like I was the one of the first black trans women that was part of the HIV Stops With Me campaign. Yeah. That was out back in 93 no back in 2000 damn um that talked about hiv positive and actually being putting back that, then though too back then That's that was like, a really hard time yeah know? um one People of the things i used that. to say there was a they had all these poster boards all over the city with buses and stuff yeah. and i would get on the bus and 
there would be my picture above me Damn. talking about HIV stops with me, you know? And so that was kind of hard. Or you're driving down the street and you see on the back of the bus, HIV stops with me. And you just kind of look around and everybody kind of starts gluing their eyes <laughs> to you. It's like, oh, I'm not a celebrity or anything, but... <laughs> oh my God. No, you're Love just that. up there, you know? So yeah. it's kind of... um. That history of me started in San Francisco, though, because that's where I was, like I said, again, I was diagnosed positive in 86, 87, yeah. and that was before AZT or anything else came out, you know? So to say today we have shots and injections and patches and shit you can take to help prevent um, from destroying your body or from dying from HIV and AIDS. Yeah. Um, so for all you folks out there that are HIV positive, you can take medication to keep you as healthy as this and gorgeous and fine as this. You just got to take the medication <laughs> for yes. real, you know? I mean, and do what you have to, you know? A lot of times it's not give up, not get into the guilt of it of my life is destroyed, my life is over, and stuff like that. I have to say, though, I did have great support. You know, I, have, I come from a family that my mother, my sister, and my family, they support me. They're standing behind me. Even through my gender transition, they were there. They supported me. My yeah. mother's been for every operation I've had. Damn. Wow. You know? Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. She was there when the doctor pulled the... Um, <laughs> I always say, when the doctor pulled the <laughs> catheter out, she was right there. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> So she's like, I made it. I want to see what okay. the upgrade is. Okay, let me see the upgrades. And, and like, that was a fabulous thing to yeah. like yeah. have that experience with my best friend. Especially and my with mom. your mom, yeah. 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 And what you said is so important about the race of HIV because one in four Black trans women are affected with HIV, and we need to hear that we can live normal, healthy, sex positive lives. You know what I mean? I'm like, sex is good. Sex is. Free, like mm -hmm. consenting sex, of course. Of course. But, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to bite a Thanks for that. Me. Boundaries are but, sexy. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> and so it's just really beautiful. You know, we're in a political year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're in 2024 where a lot is at stake, especially when it comes to trans rights. Where you are in society as a black trans woman, how are you seeing things politically? play out or what would you like to see play out in this time as a black trans woman who has saw so much already? Yeah, that was wise, heavy. It's a lot. That was a lot. That I felt like, it. Yeah, that a, I just, I, I, heard, I heard the, that, <gasps> that was like a mouthful of Shane so many is like, ways. what? <laughs> You're this professional? <laughs> you know, I know you with that. There's a lot listen, we can say in that. Listen, look at that last <laughs> one. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I got my buttons. I messed it around. We got too much gadgets in here. Yes. It's a lot. But I mean, in the sense of just life itself as a trans person and a black trans woman um, and seeing the future proceed and what's going on, I think we need to talk more. I mean, I think somewhere between COVID and trans issues um, and Trumponomics and Ooh, I like that word. the ending of an era where we had a, pre a black president that was doing so much. I think one, racism is still playing a big base of our presidency, even though we have um, a leprechaun and we have a um, an elder in office. You know, when we have somebody old as God in office, <laughs> Trying to stand up and Girl, you fight get those for our Twitter right. fingers just slamming on the keyboard. What I did she say? And that, you know, <laughs> yeah. this, I'm just gonna this, sip my you know, this man. That. I'm sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me get up. Bruh. I mean, this man can barely stand to the podium. And when he's standing at the podium half the time, you don't Child. know whether he's reading it or whether he's asleep. Oh. And <laughs> it's just, I mean, we send in millions of dollars over to another country when you got homeless people living on the streets. And you got empty warehouses where it's like, okay, right now we live in L.A. And we have, I don't know how many empty warehouses in the art district. But you got, a, you know, you're talking about, oh, we got the build apartments. You got warehouses you can work from the inside out to build where you can support some of these homeless folks on the street. Yeah. Matter of fact, 
don't work, don't worry about contractors or construction workers. Grab the homeless folks off the street mm. that got trade skills that haven't been able to put them to use because they're homeless. Yeah. And can't get a job, you know? Yeah. Have them go into these buildings and say, okay, you do the work. We help you do the work. We'll supply products and everything else. Build it, you own we'll, it. We build this. And that covers some of your rent, you know? At yeah. least these people have a place now. That's actually genius. But you're not going to say, no, we need to build an apartment. So now we got to buy area. We got to buy a lot. We got to get products. Zone it. Zone it and everything yeah. else to be able to support a building for homeless folks. Yeah. What the use is that when you got 13 buildings that are empty? Yeah. You know? I just don't get it, you know? When we have... When our country is supposed to be one of the most wealthiest. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> mm-hmm. When they say we wealthy as we are, allegedly. <laughs> and we blow money on everybody else but our own, allegedly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it makes us look really bad. Yeah. You know? I mean, we want to sit and talk about other countries and their product of how they work with their communities. But as a... Homeless person, I can go to Amsterdam and I might live at live my days on the street during the daytime. But when night fall, they protect their people. Mm-hmm. They put them in shelter and in housing. They put them in their empty hotels and give them a room for the night. Yeah, mm-hmm. their health care is paid for. I don't have to fight to get my health care. You know, here we have to fight and pay out of pocket. To, you know, I got to pay in order to keep from dying. And it's tied to a job usually, too. Right. Yeah. You know? So if you don't work, then you don't get really good health care because they're getting that all out of your check anyway. They don't yeah. tell you that. You know, when mama tell you to go get your first job, she don't tell you you got income taxes coming out of that sucker that like, you're going to send, that they're going to send to another country to, pay, to fight for some oil that we're not going to get. Yeah. They don't tell you we're going to blow up somebody else's house and that money paid for it. You know, you'll get a little, you'll get an, an eighth of it, but the rest of it is going to take care of somebody else instead of going into SSI when you get 65 to be able to take care of you. Mm. You know, we're talking about funds we don't have medically and for our own people, but we send in taking care of everybody else. Where's the smarts in that? You know, um, but back it up. Because <laughs> that was kind of heavy. Can you back it up? Um, hey, we're getting heavy. We're getting everywhere. But that's, so we when go. we talk about again, when we talk about those political parts of society that we're missing out on because of the stuff that they don't want you to see, mm-hmm. you know, they're not talking about how we're ha- not talking about HIV and AIDS anymore. You know, prep might be the big subject, but people are still getting infected every day. Right. You know, so that's stuff we don't talk about. Um, and that's being covered by racism and targetnessism and Trumpism and Ooh, Bidenism all and all the racism that's going around. Bruh. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm just going to say, as a black trans woman, not even as a black trans woman, as a black human being in America, when I watch April, I believe that was April 6th, when I saw all those and I want y'all to hear me when I say it, because I'm not going to hide January 6th. January 6th. January 6th. Don't get the date wrong, because they'll be in when the... I they'll be it. like, it was January, <laughs> okay? okay? You got it wrong. But hey, <laughs> it, don't, it didn't make a difference April either is way. 420, okay, but, girl? <laughs> <laughs> that's when I need to smoke a blunt. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to say, you know, when I watch, sit in my room and watch all those people, you know, take over <laughs> the White House, so to speak, you know? I'm going to honestly say, if that had been a bunch of black folks, we'd have all been shot. Oh, That's just serious. <laughs> Any other way, we'd have been shot. You, I mean, think about, okay, now I'm going to put it to you clearly. You know, if you want to think about it, this is January, right? Yeah. What month are we celebrating this year? Martin Luther this King. This month. Right. Okay. Now I want you to take it back even further. When we had the Martin Luther King March on Washington, mm-hmm. think about the reports and think about some of the research they did in order to be able to stop they sent that march dogs. from happening. They sent German shepherd dogs. They literally to go fought to stop and, that march from happening and hoses on and Washington. Yeah. And we still fought through that. Right. But wow. look at what they the, that and that was then when we knew we were at risk. Yeah. yeah. Today, when we thought we might be able to fight through some stuff, because you know the young people today don't give a damn. They'll fight first. I can't they see really young people don't. today during slavery. <laughs> it just ain't gonna work. 
A lot of us have been dead. <laughs> Hung. All that. <laughs> we would have talked back. We would have not That's, made it. <laughs> like, you want me to do child. what? <laughs> so, be on it. Be on it. So I'm just saying, you know, when you look at it from those perspectives, it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. What did you... How does this happen? You know? Me as a black person, I'm like... Now, I, you know, especially after 9 11. Yeah. Mm. How does this happen in America after we've had such a major attack on America that we have a president sanction something to happen like this? Now, people want to say what they want to say, but I'm going to say it like this. After looking at every news station and having that blasted all over America for the last week, or two weeks that it was all over TV about what he was, what was going on, and how we were as a a, a country were going to handle that. I'm like, you want to say he didn't incite that to some point, mm -hmm. and then he went back to his office and sat in his office while it happened. Yeah, you know, he even turned on Pence. You know that, right? So, they were they were chanting to get him, and they they just let it. But I mean, that's I mean, in so many ways. Now, here we go again. I'm going to say this like this. You know, but my black folks, we had to fight the right to vote. And in this country alone, there are still more blacks that don't vote because they feel like their voices won't be heard. But if you don't vote, how do you get your voice to be heard? You know, my mom always say, if you're not going to do the work, then shut up. Yeah. And not even don't just complain. that, Sabelle. They're trying to find ways and find loopholes to stop black people from voting. Yeah, Especially with voter like laws down south, and voter IDs laws, and everything. All of that. And I get that, but we don't vote as it is. So, I mean, it's two things it's, happening. It's one of those tandem. things where yes. you know people have died in the black community mm -hmm. in their fight for us to vote, but yet you still won't vote. I wouldn't care what you then you fight, then you vote for the lesser evil. Mm. You know? If I had to choose between Trump and Biden, then I guess Biden might get it. I mean, today we have a few more options than just the two sometimes, and we can do that in different ways. Allegedly. But, well, Bernie. we have the Green Party, Independent Party, and if you can get those in, you can probably get through. <laughs> but with that, again, Sorry. you could probably get through. I mean, it's through. still a two-party I mean, system. You know, I mean, that there's a huge pay, establishment. Everything's around money. So yeah. if you, yes. can, you can buy yeah. just about whatever you want. And that's, I figure to some level, that's what Trump did. He bought the White House. Yeah. You know, yeah. on some, and allegedly. Allegedly. Yes, Make sure to say allegedly. <laughs> no, they but love I in mean, the comments section. Actually, yeah. I just, Yeah. We're going to leave that alone. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, here's lot. the thing. Look, look at what happened with the Black Panther Party. Like, gun laws in California right now, the only reason why we have such strict gun laws is because the Black Panther Party went and marched Outward. up on those steps. And then all of a sudden, it was like, whoa, wait a second. Now all of California can't have guns because of that one action. Mm -hmm. Yet with what happened with January 6th, you've got people that look at those folks and like, they were patriots. They were saving the country. They were this. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, you can't it's wait. a matter it, it of perspective at that point. You but know? then you look at states like Florida and Texas where you can go purchase a gun and go in the grocery store with that bitch put to your hip. On your hip. Yeah. With with like a pink little clip to put it on. And, okay, and, you DeSantis know? ain't playing, is he? <laughs> Child, they no. have like those big artillery guns, machine guns or whatnot. And trust me, I've seen on social media it being landed in the wrong hands. Um, you know what I mean? Especially low-budget people. So, you know, it's, it is. You're talking about a certain is. podcast I that might be not, uh, low I mean, budget? I don't discuss I think, low budget and, podcasts. I mean, <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah, Allegedly. Level, right. I mean, but when you look at it from all angles, it's like one of those things. How do you talk about crime and gun laws and mm -hmm. stuff like that when we are, you know, you want to put, you talk about young people and guns yes. and all these school shootings we've had, but we're not tightening up our gun laws enough. You have Thoughts states that have made it possible for you to just walk in a store and pick it up same day. No, no nothing. Um, it's just a lot, you know. I mean, yeah. It can be challenging. It a can be challenging. challenging. And it, there's a lot of nuance to it all because at the same time, our country was founded on the rights of having access to guns. It's how we were able to stand up to the other country. It's this whole... 
you know, history but I'm gonna say this, nuance in you know, there. Yeah. If I go to England, you can't get a gun. For the most part, you can't have a gun. Because they learned their lesson. Just like so, what, Australia I mean, banned it? Like I look at a lot of that. these other countries that protect their communities yeah. and take care of their communities. And then you take that and you open the book and you flip it over and you say, okay, America, what? Yeah. Because now in America, everybody want a gun. It's know? an identity. And that's the other part of it, you know. That's I'm having another a whole nother faint spell go across. You know, I just saw this thing where this lady said, go back to your country. And she was Irish. And I was like, hmm, so you didn't come, your family didn't travel for Ireland to get here since yeah. you're Irish, you know. Yeah. You weren't born, you know, if this is America and you're Irish and you come from, your origins is from Ireland, you know. So how do you tell somebody to come, go back to their country? Can you go back to Ireland? And do they want you back, you know? So, I, you know, when I see a lot of that go on, it's just, like, really confusing and hurtful and stuff like that. I, I, and I said that in a sense of I hope people get enough of that to a point where it stops. Because, you know, we're constantly talking about this is America, land of the free and the brave, and I got the right to say what the hell I want. Then stop telling people to go somewhere else because you're constantly inviting them over here. Ooh. Yeah, that's... That's um, beautiful. And, you know, we're the only country that focuses on race. I'm, I'm sitting up here and I'm listening. You know, some of the critiques that we always get as black trans people specifically is, why are you always talking about race? It's because race is reality, number one. Mm -hmm. It's also the fact that just because a black person is talking about race, that doesn't mean they're a victim. I think that people who have a victim mindset that way that are trying to project onto other people can have several seats. Because it's important that we do talk about race. Yeah. It's important that we create these spaces to figure out how can we build a coalition together? How can I protect you? How can I protect you? How can y'all protect me? I think that's what we're trying to build. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I know this whole community got issues and this stuff got stuff going on. Community's and stuff. got issues? I've and never heard of that before. Shocking. Stuff in this community. The tea, it's hot. But I've never, never heard, heard of it. I need to be said. <laughs> I don't ever see myself as a victim. I see yeah. myself yes. as a survivor and an overachiever. I see myself um, as a bad bitch. <laughs> at that point, you know, okay. I do what I want, when I want, how I want. But first, you know. <laughs> but, if you want um, a booker, you I'm know where also, to find it. Right? You know, when Blossom talks about race, it's one of those things where just because I bring up race, I don't bring up race in the sense of discriminatory or anything else. Right. You know, if... I talk about race because it's been so hard, whether I'm being a black woman, a black man, a black trans woman, whatever it may be, being a black person in America is dealing with racism. Yeah. On many levels, whether you want to talk about it or not. You know, at least one of the things I talk about a lot to my friends when we bring up race is, at least in the South, they'll say it to your face. Yes. When you come to the West or to more, some of these other states, yeah. they talk about it behind your back. Be brave enough to talk about me to my face. Don't be brave enough to talk about me behind my back because when you talk about me behind my back, that's all you're doing is talking to my yes. back. I want to affirm that because you are so right. I am somebody that's from Mississippi and I'm used to racist white people, but coming out here and dealing with anti-blackness from other people of color was a shock to me. I was genuinely shocked at how being in proximity to white supremacy really does play out here, especially in our community, our trans community. Yeah. And we have to be bold to talk about it. And I know you've been in this community for a long time and you've seen so much. I'm going to tell you, girl. Yes. Honey, tell me. <laughs> it's getting deep. I'm going to tell you. Woo, you already know. So we're going there. Hold on. We got to go to a, a, a little bit. Like, what? We want to go back a little bit, you yeah. know. I mean, today you have a lot of organizations talking about black and brown and how we're this and how we're that. Yeah. But I want you to know, you know, it wasn't that long ago when the Asian community didn't like the black girls and the Latino community didn't mm -hmm. like the black girls. And we were all separated, even when it came down to our clubs, yeah. where we mm -hmm. go and what we did. You know, a lot of that was separation. You know, I came out during time period where going like, again, going to West Hollywood when I first moved here in 93, that was very much known as white boys town. Yep. And to have been a black person or a black gay person mm -hmm. in L.A. in Boys Town during that time period, you were considered discriminated against. Because unless you was sucking dick or sucking some white boy's dick or letting some white boy suck your dick and you were black, then you weren't considered part of that community. That's why you don't see the children from Inglewood, Compton, and Long Beach come to West Hollywood that often. Still to this day, that, so, that 
effect I mean, is there. So there, that's why, you know, in so many ways, and most people won't say it, is that's why the catch was invented. You know, the catch gave black folks a club to go to, and it was not that many clubs that are around where black LGBTQ folks can hang out at. Yeah. Because when you look at what's in Hollywood and around the police and around the um, stores and the management and the corporacy of that, it's not made for black folks. 100%. 100%. You know? When you, and I want, you know, for a lot of folks may have some shade against that, but I want you to take a look and take a ride down Hollywood, down West Hollywood, and I want you to go and look in some of those stores. And count how many black people are in them stores that down there. Mm -hmm. You talk about we discriminate and we always dealing with racism and racism doesn't go in everything. Go in some of them stores and tell me how many black folks you see that work in the West Hollywood district even today. Yeah, honestly... That, that brings, honestly, a great point to one of my next questions that something that I've seen in community, especially when the LGBT community was first forming, um, it almost was like they compartmentalized certain parts of the community because it was easier easier for the, the general population as a whole to kind of digest, especially white men uh, that were gay. So they were placed in these spaces constantly and the visibility was so high for them, which again impacted them to this day now where you see gay men as the highest earners in the LGBT mm -hmm. community because of the visibility, the access, the resources, et cetera. Now on the flip side, you can see our community, which you know we got completely kind of almost erased even by our own community mm -hmm. because it was easier or especially white gay men to thrive in white supremacy because they're like, well, we're not just with those people. We're different than those people. Mm -hmm. So, Mike. But you can, you know, it's one of those things I tell a lot of people. I say, you have a hard time addressing me as her, but put a drag queen on stage and you have no problem calling her she. Child. Yeah. What is that? Wake that up. You know. What is that? I have a problem with that. You know, even, and that's just dealing with the everyday community. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about our, LG, our LGB community, our lesbian, gay, bisexual community, how do you have a hard time addressing your trans sisters and brothers by their pronouns when you can put female and male impersonators on stage and they get called she 24 hours. Oh, girl. Oh, Miss Thing. All this. All that. Yeah. But all we want from you is just a little bit more respect. Yes. Yeah. You know, the same kind of respect you wanted from community when you were fighting for your LGBT rights. Yeah. You know, the same, you know, and it's just, I don't get that. You I know? don't either. I was looking at an article, um, again, watching TikTok, because that's kind of my Listen, favorite. I love TikTok. It's, it's so I crazy how some of the stuff can come out of there. So. But it was we all one of those do. things I mean, Make sure where, to follow us. We all got TikToks. Yes, okay. I have two. I actually have two TikToks now. <laughs> I, w I listened to this guy talk about how he had such issue with trans folks. Now, it was hard to listen to him being a black gay male, being a feminine black gay male. Yeah. Because it's like not long ago you were fighting to be that feminine black gay man. Mm. Yeah. You know, because you had you were thrown to be either, you know, there's a hundred other words we can put out there that we were that LGBT men were called or folks were called during that time period. But how do you separate yourself from a community that also help you go to that help you stay alive? It's white supremacy, you know? honestly. It's, it's relative. You know, close every to that. time and is I don't care what people say or how they do it. Yeah. But any fight that's been in the LGBT community, look at who were the ones that started it first. Yeah. Look at who started the fights. Look who spoke up first. Look who's who lost out the first. most right. too. Look who went homeless. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for speaking out. Look who got arrested for speaking out. Look who got look who banished. couldn't blend in you know? as well. The people you say you don't want to be around were the same people that fought for you. Yeah. Yeah. You said something that was so crucial right there, and I have been talking about it, because when we do talk about the Black queer community, there are some, not all, Black queer men that are benefiting off the transphobia that we do experience and that we do face. Yeah. There are some, I will not say a name, but there are some interesting Black comedians, Black queer comedians that got their heart time, broke by a girl. I every swear, time it feels turn around. What doll did it? Okay, can we find out what doll broke that heart first? <laughs> every, though? Number one, yes. Y'all, but then every make the time, video, girl. We want to know the tea. <laughs> every time something comes up with Dave Chappelle or whatever, oh, they she need, said the name. They listen. <laughs> they need an algorithm boost. 
they need an old algorithm boost where they want to take pictures with the person and all of the things or whatever. And it's just kind of like, but you experienced homophobia from a black celebrity when you were doing comedy. And so for me, I don't understand why you stand on the oppressive side. And and, and so and Target is nice. They get yeah. comfortable. They go to Costco. They go to Target. They finally were able to blend in society. It's a hierarchical system. And yes. then they go, you know what? I got mine. I'm good. And they leave anyone that's not on that same hierarchical system or above, they leave them behind. It's, it's, it's that way through yeah. all society. It's, it's always in this hierarchical thing. And you see this throughout every single dynamic as a mm. human that we always have to inflict these hierarchical structures in order to feel powerful. It's insecurities. It's so many different things that are bubbling up while simultaneously also still being white supremacy because in that sense, they're going, well, I'm not like them. I'm different. I'm, I'm a good one, you know? And it's almost separating the community that is the same community that would stood for you that what is it, a hundred laws are coming out this year, just now, a couple days mm. ago, and those laws keep evolving, and now all of a sudden they're talking about adults. They're even going for interracial marriage. They're going for yeah. all of it. And if we are not looking at but then, I'm just the system. Say, they're yeah. only being able to go for these things because we allow them to. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Again, it goes We're back being complicit to, in it all. You know, again, it goes back to voting, and it goes back to paying attention to what you're voting for. And showing up. I mean, yeah. because- you know, well, on one hand, you're saying, I'm going to vote for this person because they dislike, tra okay, and we're going to do this differently. I'm going to say, I'm going to vote for this person because they hate transgender laws or yes. they hate transgender folks. Okay, fine. You voted for that person because they have this bill that says they hate trans folks. Now, under, they trauma bond now, when that. you, now, now, my thing is, when you put that bill together, did you read the whole bill on who all else it affects? Yes. Because in that sense, it's one of those things where you have to look at what else is the A and B and C and the, the point, dot, point, this, that, and the other, because that's where they get you at. That's where the laws change. Yeah, they might say, okay, this is to stop trans folks from doing this, but that C top part two, section A, Affects section one B yeah. is going to have something that's going to affect your life just as well. Mm -hmm. And so when we vote for things, pay attention to what you're voting for. Don't just vote for the one piece you see on top because there's a whole list of other stuff on the bottom of that ballot that means something that's going to affect your life. You know, when they put, when Texas stopped and talked about having abortion laws and stopping women from have, going to charge them for being going through abortion, then it's one of those things where what else is down under that list is going to affect me. And we don't pay attention to that. So that's how so many laws get passed because we only see the one bullet point. We don't see the rest of them that's down on the blow. And we need to pay attention to that whole ballot. But on top of all of that that we do, we need to go vote. I mean, really, you know, you can vote by ballot. You can vote by standing in line. You can vote online. There are many ways of voting and getting your opinion. You know, it's everybody's quick to get on TikTok and Instagram and talk about what they hate and what they dislike and who they have a problem with. Yeah. But you don't go and stand in that line and put your ballot in. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do that, then shut the or hell up. Or show up to volunteer to do the you work, know? you know? Like, yeah. I don't even want to see you volunteer. I want to see you point that ballot. Yeah. yeah, put that ballot in because that's what's going to make the difference. If you don't put a ballot in, there's no change. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the things we as Black folks need to pay attention to. If we want change, we keep talking about, I, well, ain't nobody going to do nothing, ain't nobody going to do nothing, ain't nobody going to do nothing. Well, of course you didn't vote, so that's one less vote that we can't get. You know, your vote make a difference on who's in office. Yes, it does. Literally, I mean. You take you Trump need 100 won by votes not even that much. And 25 percent of that vote, yeah. then that means there's 75 people out there that didn't vote. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, it's just really frustrating when I see these trans conservatives do it, these black conservatives do it. it the feels liberals very, even do it. I mean, yeah. we've seen folks say, well, I'm liberal, I this, that, and the other, but I don't accept trans people. It's like... Yeah. Or or the fact that you don't even accept non-binary people into the trans community, because I got that criticism from a liberal progressive who said, oh, I agree with the other side. Well, here's the thing. This is why I find some of you liberal progressives a problem, because some of y'all are progressing the wrong way. I'll stay far left over here and hold you accountable as well as hold the other side accountable because we are hurting ourselves. 
And, you know, this whole conversation around voting is like, how do we get the motivation for this younger generation? Because Gen Z is now at that age where they're voting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like we're in a different capacity because, you know, we're millennials and, you know, you're, you're <laughs> a different generation. <laughs> She's a legend. She's okay. a legend. She's in the legend generation. <laughs> but, but here's the thing, though. Things were so different from... When we were 18. Oh, yeah. So it was oh, completely yeah. different. I mean, thing. okay. You know, when I was 18, they was making you register. Yeah. Uh, selective service. Selective so, service. I mean, yeah. your voting depended on you being drafted. Um, yeah. You're registering. And, I mean, hey, I was just, I was part of that whole draft process. When I was 18, I had to register and everything else. Um, so, I'm that old. You know. Yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Definitely allegedly. I'll be 35 forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this in this generation, these generations coming up, Gen Z and Gen A, they don't, they won't probably experience a lot of that because we have been making it easier for them. And so TikTok is such a powerful platform, and those younger generations are utilizing it. I really just wish that they would utilize it in a way where we can get out and vote and, and where they can also understand that their voice. Their voice does matter. Because the reason why a lot of them refuse to vote is because they're like, my vote is not gonna do anything. Trump may still get elected even if I go and I go and vote. But at least you voted. Exactly. You know, that's one of the things. Regardless of whether you think your voice is heard, at least you voted. Yes. You voted for one or the other party, you know, and that's what makes the difference. It's, you know, because if you don't vote, then you haven't done anything to change anything. Mm. And as much as you say, I don't know whether my voice is being heard, if you don't vote, it's never going to be heard. But at least if you vote, you can say, I voice my opinion by saying, I want this person over this person. Yes. And so as a youth of any youth out there is wondering whether or not your voice is being heard, you make a difference by voting. You know, my black young 18 to 12 and 21, 13 to 24, you know, this is a time period where you can almost do and be anything, you know. And I'm going to take that back a little bit because I come from the 1800s, as we were talking about. <laughs> Another 18. <laughs> oh, nope. You know, when I was born, it was 60. <laughs> but um, it's one of those things where, again, and I love my mom for the support that she gives me, but growing up as um, a Black LGBT youth in America, in the South, you know, mm. I was and going to boarding school and Catholic school, you know, my mom raised me with the intent that I don't care what two things society can't take away from you, who you are, and your education. The more education you get is the better for you. Because that's one thing I don't care what you do in life. No one can ever take from you is education. Yeah. You know, um, education has gotten me where I am today in so many ways. Um, and when I say that, I say that in a sense, as someone that's 50 plus, I'm a personal trainer. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. Allegedly. I was going to say education right now because now we could talk <laughs> you know, about when you talk what about you education, do, you know. Yeah. You know. I I been I've been a case manager for years working at Children's Hospital Adolescent Division. I've worked for other different amounts of agencies, uh, Minority AIDS Project. Um you know, there's just a history of things we could talk about. I've worked with um when it comes to working in the community and working um with our elders. Um but I do right now currently, as someone 50 plus, work <laughs> in a community where we work on health care for all LGBTQ, trans, and non-binary community members. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say my job as well as the agency that or the gym that I work in is one of probably only ones of its kind in America, I want to say. Or at least I'm going to say that. <laughs> I don't care Get that marketing saying, in. But I'm going to say we're one of um, everybody's gym, which is located off of 1840 San Fernando Road. Yeah. You know. Um, say that one her. more time for folks because we want to say it low and everybody's slow. Everybody's gym. I want you to go become a gym membership. Yes. It's the perfect Even time. if you don't show up, just get a membership and then just <laughs> donate that way, gym, okay? You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, and this so, this gym is actually like it's heavily trans. Is it trans owned? That's my understanding. It's trans right? owned. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it's trans operated mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, 
So we and the have equipment is amazing. I'm telling you. <laughs> Are they hiring over there? Uh, <laughs> they're always looking for front desk staff, and we're always looking for trainers. Um, we're also always looking for different people that know how to teach classes. Mm. Um, one of the so our gym is again located over in Cypress Park off of San Fernando Road, and we're open from 6 a.m. to about 9:30 p.m. Most day, Monday through Friday, most days, weekends, the hours vary. You can go on the internet and check that out. Mm -hmm. But um, I want to say a, about 95% of the trainers, personal trainers, are LG, are trans men or and women. Not trans men, uh, getting it up. <laughs> so we have some Hello. really <laughs> handsome trans men working wait, at wait, our gym. Men. Wait, don't you have like a class of all trans men that you're like a, a little harem that you run? <laughs> what? Yeah, no. she's got a little harem of trans men that <laughs> she runs. She looked at all the trans men that doing work have. Yes. <laughs> We have a program called. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the producer for getting the sound. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We have quite a few trans folks, trans men and women, and gender non binary trans folks that work at everybody's gym. We offer um, things from such as acupuncture, we offer body massage, we offer um, masseuse therapy. Um, Parking's good. We have parking, which is located within the gym's parking lot. We also have the state park, which is across the street, which has some free parking and lots of space. So all you have to do is walk across the street. Um, and you offer classes. And we have and several training, classes. Right? We even have. No, girl, but just you. Listen, listen. Just you, right? <laughs> I what do, do a body do? works. I, yeah. uh, I do a training. Um because they're trying to get the body kettlebell. like this at the 50 plus. <laughs> so I'm trying to give people the tips because we're trying to get those people connected to you. I have more so, strength training. Yes. And so a lot of people tend to, you know, one of my things is. That's why you get all the trans men because we're trying to get that <laughs> little. Woo -woo. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I mean, one of the things I got into, I had a friend. She was like, you work out constantly and you should become a personal trainer. And then. I got into that and went to study with NASM and Show Up Fitness mm. to become Show Up Fitness is a program. I have to put that out there. They were really nice to me. Um, they're one of the programs where you can go up and it's all about train the trainer. You know, um, just because you have a certification doesn't mean you know how to train someone. You know, to be able to best train a client and to best know how to work with them around nutrition and everything else is to work with another trainer that's already been doing the work. Yeah. And so for that sense, um, Show Up Fitness, which is located off of, sun, off of Sunset, okay. um, is a really good place to go if you're interested in becoming a personal Girl, trainer. we're going to everybody, okay? We're not sending them to the... But, uh, All right, go to Everybody Fitness. But everybody Fitness <laughs> yes. is... So just give you some really cute stuff about it because I, you know, it's one of the gyms that has indoor-outdoor gym. Mm -hmm. We have a really cute outdoor gym. We yeah. have sauna. We have nutritionists on site. Again, we have chiropractor on site. We have, you name it, it's on site and just about. And we don't have separate locker rooms. We have a one oh. set locker room. We have unisex bathrooms and showers. So on it's the really door, nice. it's like, all about yeah, yeah. all love genders that. and being gender inclusive. Feels very safe over there. So, I love that. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. I've been. You know, it's like the, you can walk into warm. the gym and we have pictures on the wall that show community. You know, painted on the walls that, that show this is a gym for everybody, every race. You know, Beautiful. and so that's one of the best things I love about that gym. Um, the, one of the owners, his name is Sam, and Sam is like a godsend to me. Um, when it comes to working out and giving to the community. We also not just only have Everybody's Gym, we have a sister company, which is Siblings, which has its own studio and its own podcast set up and its own. Not plugging a podcast on my podcast. <laughs> Damn. She getting, I okay. Mean, so if you're one of Go watch their podcast and ours. Well, All right. Really in that sense, <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, I'm we have this space for folks that yeah. just necessarily don't have the funds or wanting to get just get started. You know, and you don't have that complete setup. Mm -hmm. It's a place where you can go and do that. Yeah. And oh. we have the space for that available. Most of our events and parties are held at our si um, siblings, which is still located off of San Fernando Road. They're about maybe a mile and a half apart. Okay. And so, um, yeah, it's a lovely gym. And we have a really nice, just awesome team of people there. You know, if you want to come into everybody's, you know, we have our line of clothing. Look, we got it on the screen. We have right our there. merch. So ah, you look, see, look, we're look, up look, there. Look. 
Everybody's yes. gym is just the best. And I mean, I don't care where you're at in your stage of fitness. It's one of those places where you can definitely come in. You know, I don't care whether you're slim, thick, juicy, whatever. You know, we want you to be able to come in there and feel comfortable about working out and not having to worry about going to a 24-hour fitness or something like that and being ashamed about what your body looks like. This is a place for every body size and shape. And so, and gender, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you throw all of that in there, you know, we're always told to go to the gym or work out. You know, you have to protect your high blood pressure, your diabetes, and all of this stuff. And you're so ashamed to go to so many of these other gyms. We're one of those that offer that. We also, I do several classes online. Um, we have this thing called Body Everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's an online class and you can take, it's with several of our instructors, but I do a kettlebell and a um, dumbbell workout. Um, oh. My thing is working with kettlebells, you know, it's one of those things, it's one of those pieces of equipment you can do almost any exercise with at home. Yeah, I like mm. a kettlebell because you, know? you can like swing it too because you get that like little momentum from the yeah. weight too. I'm scared I'm going to hit so, something. <laughs> one of, and my thing of it is, is like, so I work primarily with trans folks. I'll work with anyone that wants to work out, okay. but I primarily work with trans men and women. And what got me into that is the fact that so many of us are um, losing or afraid to go to the gym because of whether or not we're going to bulk up or we're not going to do this or, you know, women are worried or about. Or judged at the gym or is it safe? And is there going to yeah. be, This is a place know. where you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. I want you to love who you are at this gym, you know. Yeah. It's one of those things where when you walk in, you're greeted by a community, you know. When you walk through, you're greeted oh, by man. your community. Yeah. And it's that beautiful. I mean, um, we're not always busy. I mean, if you come between that five and six hour, that's kind of our rush hour area. But also, like, by 8 o'clock, we have programs going on. There's always a class going on that you can join. Um, that sounds like a beautiful community. Now, is can we go to the website to actually, like, book you? You can How book do we me. book you? So if you want to book me to train with me, you can either book me through my email address, which is located on the website itself. Okay. Or you can go to Vargo Pro, which can is you spell my spell that for the app, folks. V A G R O Pro P R O okay. Okay. Um, dot com, and you can book me through that. You can also go through that and see some of the work that I've done, mm -hmm. as well as some of the clients I've worked with, and read some of the reviews and stuff like that. I think there's some bad ones. There's also some so good ones too. <laughs> no, there's but some bad ones. Okay, I, you know, I feel the like the bad team. reviews and the good reviews. Yeah. The bad reviews teaches me. The good reviews show my work. You know, yeah. and so I've been doing this for the last three years. Um, it's kind of like my favorite favorite hobby. It's one of those things where I do it because I want to and not because I have to. Yeah. Um, uh, I hate to have a job where I have to work because then I lose interest. I enjoy working out. Um, I enjoy eating. And Girl, I enjoy eating I too. Work. I got that part now. Okay. I got that part. I love my cakes and pies. <laughs> and if I'm going to eat my cakes and pies and cookies, you know, I need to know how to keep this shape too. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come know? on, shape. Um, <laughs> mm. You know, I'll be 60 in four years and I want to be able to be fabulous. Beautiful. You know, I want to look like Angela. Not Ashley. she said it. Okay. You heard that, right? <laughs> you heard 60 in four years. I was on the phone with you yesterday. I said, how? Girl, I've known you how long? Damn. Because we I, met when I was, what, like 18, 19 years old. Yeah, I was a you baby. Was a baby I, Remember with no tea or nothing? I had nothing <laughs> on there. Shit. You know, I mean, yeah. Um, and so I, I do, my primarily workout is basically strength training. Okay. Um, and just to give a story about, like I said, if you want to know more about me, Google me. And I don't say that in a sense of jokingly, but a lot of stuff I've, you know, one of the things that, being an HIV positive trans black woman that I have to say that I'm grateful for is the ability to be visible Ooh, for yes. other trans folks in the community. Um, what is it? Because I don't know. we don't. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I mean. Okay, that's what we need. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. I just got this curious, bro. Damn, damn, the shade. <laughs> the shade of it all. You know. I thought I we were supporting each other here. We are, wow. We are. 
<laughs> the love, no, girl. Then, listen. <laughs> but I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, really in a sense Hit of, the button again, girl. No. Dick <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. uh, It's just all love. Just all love. It is. I love it. You know, it's, but I do feel like we constantly, when I look at who I am and what I am as a person, and I tell people, if you want to know about me, I think, you know, and that's another part of this whole process and being trans black in America is, you know, I'm grateful to be able to sit around and say, I am a, you know, at my gym, I'm the only black trans woman of color working there, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I'd love to see other black trans folks that are in personal training at the gym and working. Um, I don't like being always the only one, but, you know, to be able to represent as the black community and trans women, that's something I love. Um, but we need more of that, you know. And again, like we were talking about employment and stuff like that earlier. One of the things is that we really... One of the things I want people to see or want to understand, which I feel like we have more today than we did when I transitioned, because when I transitioned, I couldn't go into Starbucks. I couldn't go into Target. Yeah. I couldn't go into Ross or any oh, they got department training store to, say to see that the there are trans folks working behind the counter. Yeah. Much less, you know, even back then during my transition, it was harder to see LGBT folks in some of these positions. You'd be like, there's a but, lesbian at Starbucks? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> With a beard? Oh, my goodness. Ooh. <laughs> and so... What's her number? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so today you can see that, you know, when people, you know, it's one of those things where, like, I tell a lot of people, you know, so many people have these bad images of trans folks. And I think that's because of in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, the only time, and even still today, because I have yet to see it any differently, but watch NCIS, um, Law and Order, you see um, Criminal Minds and all of those it's other TV porn. stations allegedly mm -hmm. um, <laughs> say that they support trans folks. Yeah, you might have us on there, but what do you have us doing? You have us dying and prostituting on the street, you know? Put us in, in or being strippers. You know, instead of having us dying and prostituting on the street, why don't you have us be one of the detectives or and a police officer that's working the job and not one police officer that's working on the job being discriminated against and we're having to fight for our They're rights as there. a cop on TV. Yeah. They're just you know, there. Just let us be that cop. Yeah. yeah. You know? the um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's one of the things that when we talk about the future of the trans community, that's more of the empowerment that I want to see is more of us behind the, you know, in front of the counter or in those desks. When I walk into an office, I want to, you know, I don't give a fuck if it's um, Bar Barnes and Barnes Insurance Company. You know, if there's a trans woman answer the phone, that would be one of the greatest things in the world. And to know that she was hired to be working with that insurance company yeah. without being known as just a trans woman, but because she has the experience and the skill to do the job, yeah. yeah, you know, is the other part of it. You know, let her be behind the desk doing the job. You know how much that changed a young person's life. It's one of those things where, and I take this, I always reflect on this when things get really hard for me is I took up when I worked for Children's Hospital back in 2005 as a case manager, um, one of my clients, her mother came in. Well, I had a couple clients come in. I worked with a lot of youth during that time. So, but one, when I first started, some of the things that I was asked and told was it was so shocking to walk into a clinical situation mm -hmm. and see a black trans woman enrolling a client into healthcare. Yeah, people forget how transition. powerful of an image that is for you know, everyone involved. I had mothers and fathers walk in and just were in shock that I had that job. Because they had the image of us being prostitutes. You know, because the image that society yeah. puts out and the entertainment puts out is that we're on this whole straw. Or we're, and that's just, we're not, I mean, just to be honest, we I be, love we you, Shay, yeah. but that's just from an outside race perspective, because yeah. when you talk about a black trans woman, I'm supposed to be less than even that. Yeah. Ooh. 100%. You know? Wow. So oh, yeah. when I'm considered less than even than that, you know, 
You know, we have all these different levels that we put people in, and trans folks are less than anything as it is. We're last on the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. But when you're a black trans woman, you get thrown under the dirt and the mountain gravel too. Yep. And so when you look at it from that perspective and they come into the office and you've talked to a trans woman that's black, HIV positive and surviving and living and thriving, and she's enrolling your kid in a medical program to get them health care. It's one of the biggest shocks people see. Mm. It humanizes yeah. folks and, that have been but dehumanized. It makes people say, Well, yeah. damn, my kid can survive and have a life. Yeah. And so today, some of those kids that I work with are doctors, lawyers, because of your actors, example, you know, living their best life, whatever they're doing. Yeah. You know, and I'm so proud to be a part of that because. What their parents saw when they brought them in showed them that. And what they saw when they saw me at the desk sitting there showed them that they can do and be anything they wanted to, the same as my mother once told me. And they did it with proudness because mm. they seen somebody that shouldn't have been in that position do the work and make their lives change. So for that simple you know, for that alone, my life is. Let me get I a button accept for that. the gratitude. Yes, I was gonna say because thank you for doing the work. You know, <laughs> um, it is it has made an impact even in my life as a trans man because I am in L.A. and the work that you've done, even the idea that I believe you were the first uh, trans woman to get married in the state of California. I was the first black trans woman to get married in 2005. Yeah. Matter of fact, my anniversary is coming up. Okay, anniversary. It's February 13th. Make sure to send Venmo money, you know. We ain't got no wedding bells. We ain't got no wedding bells on here. We'll get a program for next time, all right? But My I husband's name is Louis Loreca. He was yeah. initially from New York. He moved to L.A. Um, we got married February 2013 at Minority AIDS Church in Los Angeles off of Jefferson. And, yeah, I was the very first. It's something... After, it was funny because soon after I got married, I ran for Quest for the cover yeah. and became the first black trans woman wow. of color yeah. on the... Yeah, girl, she got a lot of history. I amazing. told you. Why do you think trans I wanted her on the show? Is, See, I didn't get here until 2016. <laughs> yeah. So this is all new for me. Yeah. So um, I've done, you know, and I'm still being, you know, loyal and of service to APIT for giving me that opportunity. But it was like so many Good things happened to me during that time period as a first for the city of Los Angeles or the state of California as a black trans woman. Yeah, a lot of it isn't talked about, yeah. but I know it's there. And like I said... Um, well, the folks that are in there for, know who you are and right. know your history. And that's why I wanted to bring you here today because I wanted other folks, not just those folks in those silos, but the, the, the community as a whole, even the world as a whole, to actually see the work you've done because... It's impacted me, again, as a white trans man because of the work that you've done, even with the work with HIV. I mean, my incident happened and my PEP situation happened, and I can even see and trace it back to your work at the HIV Commission of how all of that is connected. And I just thank mm -hmm. you for that. And that's why I really wanted to uplift you today and celebrate you and bring you on the podcast to just show the world who you are more and really uplift that. And and honestly, having these conversations, thank you both. I mean, I know I'm just a white trans guy, and this, and we're talking about black trans women. Yes. But a, I'm always comfortable to have that fucking conversation because I understand how white supremacy works. Well, and I how mean, it flows, you know, it's it's one of okay. So to have a trans masculine guy at the as my host, it is one of the most of awesome things when you have two black trans women sitting beside you. Yeah. Because I I just want to say in 2000. We're going to even go back further than that. Maybe 1999, the only programs that were available for trans men, period, was FDM Alliance. Yeah. And a lot of people don't remember FDM Alliance. No, they don't. But that was kind of the only organization that was available. And very few trans men were a part of that because they just didn't want to deal with the visibility, the, the BS, and the humility. The community, of there's a lot. That yeah. came out. And so wow. for a lot of people, you know, I think a lot of times as trans, as a trans woman of color, Trans men get a bad rap a lot of the times, and a lot of their history and a lot of their stories aren't told. Um, and trans women's stories are told, but I think you have, it goes back into again, you know, we want to keep this subject. You know, I love talking about race because I'm a dark skinned black trans woman. 
And so when you look at from that perspective, a lot of people have pushed the white camaraderie of trans men as being able to be the ones to step in and make us strong and lift us up. But no, you know, black trans women end up a lot of the times have made spaces for trans men. Yeah. Because 100%. Other, yeah. other parts of I've our trans women have trans pushed men. trans men out yes. because we've thought they've not been able to sit at the table with us because their issues are different from ours. Yeah. You know, I remember a time when I was told, well, they're still men. So if they're considering themselves men, their issues are different from us. Well, even but they're like, not. You know, I mean, when we talk about healthcare and HIV, you know, trans men put, are at a higher risk than trans women when it comes to that because trans girl, we men got are two having holes. sex with No, men. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. You know, I got you two of them the expression too. on my <laughs> face right now. <laughs> you know, I, want, I got two. <laughs> and I love both of them. I get them both used too. Hey, what you talking about? Link in bio. <laughs> <laughs> I am gagging I right now. Okay, too hard. But girl. you, but you know what though? Y'all are so right because our liberation is tied. <laughs> Thank you. Our liberation is tied. Thank you. And we need to be there to support each other. And I'm really glad that you said that because that's really, really important. It's, I'm over here just thinking like. You know what I mean? And especially with you, I think that you intentionally do the work to allow and create spaces for us to be able to amplify our voices. And yeah. I love that. I don't think that all white trans men do it, though. I think that there are some that are in it for, the, for themselves, to be quite honest with you, but it's not all of them. Yeah. But it's, I don't think they're necessary. I mean, on so many levels, it's not about being in it for themselves, I think they feel like that is being snatched away from them. Mm. It's when we go back to that process of, you know, when we talk about, again, racism. Racism. Yes. It's one of those things where we talk about, oh, this is being taken from us because we don't have this. Or yeah. I can't, I don't get food stamps. Or how come they got a job and they get this and yeah. they get that and they get this? Yeah. So, okay. You have no I'm idea how many it. trans men right now <laughs> yeah. are just looking at this screen and going, I feel seen. Thank you. Well, hold on. They may be hating right. me right now. So let me make sure uh -oh. I clear about the buttons. <laughs> let me get a button. Because <laughs> they're going to they're gonna go on my page and some of them are going to go on my trade page and troll me or whatever. You know, I, I was saying that in a way because... To the trolls, to the trolls. I, I'm saying that in a way because of, like, personal experience. And you're right about that nuance because, number one, they're still trans like us or whatever. But because they technically sit at the top of the hierarchy in the trans community by being white or yeah. whatnot, priority, I could understand their needs not getting met or feeling like their needs not getting met or whatever because it's like... I'm still a trans person. Mm -hmm. And just being a trans person in America, I don't always get good access to care. Yeah. I'm coming in the doctor's office. Somebody's misgendering me. Yeah. I, there's this embarrassment, this shame about my body. I have body dysphoria. And it's just, it's a lot going. So And it's I one of those things it. where, as you know, again, I got into this. I, okay, I'm going to take it back a little bit. I don't know how much time we have or anything, but I'm just going to say it from this point. You know, I transitioned in 90s. One of the clinics I went to was um, South Market Health Center, mm -hmm. which is located in San Francisco. And one of the other agencies I went to was Tom Waddell Clinic, which mm -hmm. is also located in San Francisco. And it's kind of one of the hot clinics for homeless folks. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the first clinics that actually started giving trans women and trans men their um, injection shots and giving them medical care. One of the first agents, one of those agencies that actually did your blood work to see what your blood count looks like. It mm -hmm. actually, you know, because so many people want to say, we just shoving out hormones, we just giving hormones away and making people take these and not doing any research. Mm. Well, we are. It's just not being recorded and it's just not being kept up. And the people that are in charge of that, like CDC, not necessarily oh, want to do the work for so many years. You know, it took, <laughs> I mean, I started my home again. I started my transition. I was an HIV positive woman back in the 90s. I, I got diagnosed in the 80s. So from the 80s till the 90s when I transitioned, there was nothing for trans folks. Mm -hmm. You know, we were either buying our hormones black market or going in the corner of some doctor's office and spending $25 and $30 to get a shot and dealing with it the best way we knew how. So for me at the time, you know, it was one of those things. I was going through some stuff in life. We all have our problems. And my doctor was on there. He was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. 
you know, but we're going to help you get where you want to go because you got something you need to do. And if it wasn't for my doctor um, at that point in time and my very good medical case, again, it takes support. You know, people are always talking about what support. I had a really good doctor, Christopher Storr, and I had a really good nurse practitioner, Ms. Marilyn Finch Spreller from San Francisco. And they were there for me for the beginning, you know. And so helping me get my hormones and writing me scripts because he didn't know what the hell he was doing. Mm. But he knew that was going to make my life change as long as he paid attention to my blood works and what my levels looked like, I was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And it did work, you know. But not everybody get that. And for trans men, it was a lot of the stuff, you know, coming from San Francisco and moving to L.A., a lot of this time, it was one of those things where I didn't see my trans brothers getting those services. So when I moved here, that was part of my biggest fight was yeah. fighting for my trans brothers because in San Francisco they were there. And we love you our know? trans brothers. They we were really no, we I like I thank block, you so you much. Know? And so yeah. I don't, you know, when I first moved here, I didn't see a lot of that. So it's like every time I went to a, a meeting or we were doing something, I was like, where's such and such? Because yeah. that we need that representation. We need to hear what they need to talk about. We need to know when we make decisions for trans folks, we're not just making them for the girls, we're making them for the guys too. Yeah. Because just like they're prost- we prostitute on the streets, they prostitute yes. too. Yes. And they need the same services in healthcare because we're all trying to survive. Yes. Yeah. You know, but um, there's so many of us in, you know, and I'm just going to throw it out there. You know, just because you say you present as womanhood, there's a lot of us still involved in that pissing contest when it comes to trans services and trans health care and fighting. You know, often, you know, trans folks get into this corner and we don't know how to back down and just be a little patient or give that person the opportunity to share who they are and what's going on. You know, it's always got to be a trans woman story. But what about the men in our community, mm. you know? Why can't we hear what their stories are? Because yeah. <clears throat> theirs are just as much needed. Yes. You know, and they're the ones that often, you know, and this has nothing to do with the program that's out there, but trans men are often very, very much invisible because they seem to present so much better than trans women. And mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons why a lot of the fights there, because trans women, if it's not for surgery, it's a lot harder for us. Um and that's where that battle comes, but nobody tends to give the trans man that room and space to be themselves and talk about what's going on in their world. But you do, though, and that's the thing, and that's why I wanted to have the two of you on, is because, like, black trans women especially have supported me, and I want to say that clearly on a platform that there's been a lot of black trans women that have supported me and have stood up for me and folks like you in certain spaces. Because you remember even, what, 12 years ago? Mm-hmm. I was the only trans man in the room. I was the only trans man in the room. There wasn't anything that you see now today. And that's why I just thank you so much again for even extending that to me because now some of the work that I've even done, I was able to shoot another episode today with another trans man earlier that you heard a little bit of. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do something similar by taking some of your privileges, which is weird to say as a black trans woman, you have privilege, (laughs) but in a space like the community, there is a weird nuance that there's kind of a privilege there that you have of a platform. And then you shared that with trans men and especially black trans men too. I mean, there's so many, again, different nuances of our community. And it's just like, that's what I love about this podcast. That's why I love, that's why I'm trying to create these conversations with people to have these conversations about the real things and and really have like, hey, I see you, you see me. I've got some resources, you've got some resources. Let's do something with it mm-hmm. instead of this constant competition with, you know, trans men and trans men, trans women and because tra- I'm sure there's competition within trans women uh, oh, the yeah. intersectionality. Yeah. You're yeah, like, I already won the competition. Uh, All right, we already know you won, girl. <laughs> but <don't>, <laughs> no, 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 I'm being shady. I'm being shady. <laughs> but but I mean because and some but you're right though. Um, the competition that goes in with, within the trans com- women community is just outrageous. Yeah, yeah, on so many levels when we're all fighting for the same right. Yes. You know, it's like we tear each other down every day um, to go nowhere. Yeah. You know, because you're not elevating. Nobody's looking at you any different. You're just another black trans woman, you know, or you're just another trans woman. So by tearing one down, you haven't stepped up anywhere. You've just shown who you really are to the world. Yeah. You know, um, 
I, I just really feel, and there's so many black. <laughs> yeah, I had to, not the I had to be very careful what yes. fun it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hit the drum roll with it. You want to hit it? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> but that is a sign we are wrapping up soon, okay. to be honest, to, to give us our little drum roll out. Yes. Um, yeah. Where the hell do we follow you on like Instagram, so TikTok, on Instagram and all of that? Instagram and TikTok. Because it's Miss under, Lady Mocha, are we doing? Well, I'm or is that on still the, Instagram like Instagram as... Isabel Simone Lareca. Okay. Okay, come on, name. Miss Lady Mocha. Yes. Which is my alter ego. Oh. Okay. You want to deal with Sabelle, you don't want to deal with this lady. Mocha. Oh, okay. Because Lady Mocha. Girl, I want to smoke with Lady Mocha, though. Okay. <laughs> I like smoking with her. Okay. She's, She's that girl. You don't want to be bothered with, you know. Um, she remember Mel's Sabelle. diner? Remember Mel's diner? <laughs> I'm um, Trainer Sabelle on TikTok. Um, again, I'm at Vargo Pro if you want to book me for a class. Um, I do have special ratings um, set up already. Um, and then, again, you can also go to Everybody's Gym Los Angeles on, in Cypress Park off of San Fernando Road and come by the gym. If just nothing, you know, your first time coming in, you get it free anyway, you know, just check out the gym and see what it's about. It might not be for you. You might be that trans girl, that trans boy just can't handle it. Being around a lot of trans folks working out. I mean, it's a beautiful place, but if you can handle being around other trans folks and taking off your clothes and working out a little bit. Not taking off your clothes, yeah. girl. I <laughs> knew you were running a trans boy harem. I knew it. I knew it. I told Blossom about it. I said, why is she training all these trans men? She's doing something with that. No, I mean, <laughs> honestly. You caught. I have a. Where, where's the button for you got caught, girl? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, one of my clients is Bruh. just turning. Um, <laughs> Bruh. Bruh. You're in college. Uh huh. And, so she's you know, uh, grooming them early. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, girl. I'm too, girl. I know. Okay. Y'all know, know in the know. comment section, they're okay, going to be. Listen, we got to give something to this off. Twitter. Okay. We got to give them something to talk about. <laughs> all right. So. Okay. This is not a Cat Williams session. <laughs> we can make it. Hold on. Let me get a little jump. Although, I just want you to know, Cat, I love you. I think you're the bomb comedian, though. And everything you said was, ooh, it makes a girl think. But anyway, you know. And it brought some receipts. That I was like, oh, that adds I'm up. Just, I okay. it. You know, I'm going to put it like this. You know, my, and, and this is my only short tea on the comedy thing is, you know, I hear a lot. You know, I, I love Dave Chappelle as a comedian. I give him his flowers for being a black man mm -hmm. um, and all that. But what you've do done one, two, three different series of comedic shows about trans women. And I think at some point, you start to look like you've been hurting or some trans woman hurt you. Three yeah, times a lady. Um, I agree. That's what they I say. Mean, <laughs> I agree. Because at this point, and it's not really, you know, I don't want to say it in the sense, I don't want people to get the idea that I'm being jokingly about him. But yeah. it's getting to the point where you've spoken three different times about us in your comedic yes. jokes. You've said what you've had to say about us. Some of us love it. Some of us don't. Some of us will want you to go die off in some kind of mountain, ocean, and blow up in a plane. Some of us don't, you know? And, but as a black man, I give you your praises. You've been around. Yes. You've done the work. And you're one of the most fabulous comedians I've ever seen. But at some point, it becomes tiring. Girl, the doll you know, that broke his heart, please uh, make the video so we can get all the tea. Yes. You know, I mean, <laughs> I love the publicity of him that he gives, you know, because for me, that's what it looks like at this point. Mm -hmm. It's just more publicity for trans folks. And, you know, on so many levels, it's one of those things when we get told as a kid, you know, you're either chasing, you don't care whether you have good, good advice or dirt, bad advice, as long as you get some advice. And yeah. so for this, for from his platform at this point in time, it's one of those things where I don't care whether it's good entertainment or bad entertainment, you're still uplifting us either way it goes. Every time you talk about a trans person, that you're raising part. the trans community because you're giving them something to search for within the years. I mean, if you say nothing, then that would be nothing that we can platform on that says that about trans women. But when you're constantly boasting and constantly talking about a community, you know, it's one of those things we talked about as black folks. You know, when we talk about racism and stuff in the community, you want to say black people this, black people that, black people this. But every time you talk about a black person, you're lifting them, whether it's good or bad. You're still lifting me. You know, it's one of those things. You know, Teddy Pendergrass did a whole lot of things. He was getting his dick sucking and everything else in a car accident. But did he stop making his coin? No, he did not. Bruh. 
<laughs> you know, he still got paid. So yes. the more you talk about us, the more we get paid. The more you talk about us, the more you advertise us. The more you talk about us, the more you make space for us. Regardless of whether it's good, regardless of whether it's bad, you're still making face for the trans community. Mm -hmm. Whether it's women or men, you're making that space for us. Because that gives us the, you know, just like everybody talking about Dave Chappelle and everybody on TikTok talking about cat women. I mean, Cat Williams. Cat <laughs> Williams. Well, I'm, his new name is Cat Woman now because he does get the ladies. So <laughs> he loves women. I love yeah. that. You know, it was funny because I just take saw his compliment. I saw his thing where on Friday where he grabbed the pliers from underneath the sink and told Damien he was, a, "I'm a boy, Damien. I'm a boy. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm a trans woman. I'm a trans woman, Cat. You know? Oh my god! But um, <laughs> Damn. but I love you. You know, but I mean, look at the difference. Cat Williams is a man who and knows where he's at, knows what he can offer, yes. knows what he's bringing to the table, know who he is as a man and a comedian, mm -hmm. allegedly. But he doesn't have to constantly have trans women in every conversation that he has. Yeah. And still gets his grip. Yeah. He's still helping people and doing his job. Whereas you got this other comedian, every other time he's talking about some, every other time you look up, he's got to throw in to make his comedic entertainment that much more popular. So I'm going to talk about this trans woman one more time or this trans community one more time because yeah. that's going to give me the audience that I need, the money that I need, mm -hmm. and everything else. So again, you're, yeah. it's not building or tearing anybody down. It's just putting a little bit more money in your pocket because you got folks now listening to what, what you're saying, whether it's good or bad. And radio stations and all of those are talking. So Well, on that note, I'm going to have to say I, I'm i going to make a conspiracy theory that maybe Dave Chappelle is actually a secret activist, and he's really just trying to bring our name out there so much that it, it brings that conversation forward. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that actually not, works. I was that looking, actually works I was with the conspiracy theory right there. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you, Sabelle, so much for coming today thank and you. having this conversation. Um, just thank you for the work you've done. Everything you are as a legend, um, I hope people look you up and Google you and find out more about you, your story, how to support you, get trained by you. Blossom, you know I love you. I love you know, you more. You, like, we love getting into trouble together. Yes. <laughs> and um, stay tuned for more episodes on Transparency Podcast. My name is Shane Ivan Nash. I'm your host for the day. This is Blossom C. Brown. And uh, this is it. This is the episode. That's it. Bye. Stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe, please. Subscribe. Like and subscribe. Hit that button right. Like it's like over here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere. I don't know where we are. Yeah. Hit one of those buttons that say subscribe and put all the notifications too. We want to make sure to put that notification because we're going to have a lot more content coming out this year and we want to stay on top of that, folks. So have a good one.